Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 5E. We're going to talk about what we've learned from genome-wide association studies. In particular, we've learned that most of the genes that these studies are able to find have only small effects on phenotype. So our goal is to understand how natural genetic variation, um, which is intrinsically quantized into your either a base is either an A or a G or a C or a T, but this discontinuous genetic variation causes smoothly varying phenotypic variation in all of the phenotypes that we see around us. And a big component of the explanation is that most DNA differences aren't like the DNA differences that you learn about in a, text, in a genetics textbook. Instead, most DNA differences have only small effects on phenotypes. As a parallel to this, or a corollary, each phenotype is affected by differences at many different positions in the genome. Not just at different positions within a single gene, but at many different genes. Now, we can think about this in the context of our discussion of human height. So we said that we know that the heritability of height is 80%. Most of the differences in height between different people are caused by differences in their genes. So when the first genome-wide association studies on height were done, um, dividing people into particularly tall people and particularly short people, and examining which alleles of SNPs these people had, two positions, only two positions were identified where the difference in SNP allele was correlated with a difference in height. And these two differences ex each explained only about two millimeters of difference in height. That's a tiny amount of difference compared to the range of heights that we see. So in fact, it only explained 0.4%, less than 1% of the differences in height were explained by differences at these SNP positions even though we know height is highly heritable. Now, we, I don't know how many people these first studies analyzed, but later studies, there were three more studies, and they found 42 more positions. And again, each of these positions in the genome had only a very small effect on height. Altogether, even though they'd analyzed 10,000 people, so this should have been quite a powerful study, they only were able to explain 5% of the difference in height. Since then, there have been at least 41 more studies. And when all of these studies are combined, we've, they found 180 different places around the genome where different SNP alleles were correlated with differences in height. As we've said before, it's not necessarily the case that the SNP alleles themselves caused the differences in height. They may have just been nearby. But altogether, all of these SNP positions still explained only 10% of the difference in height, even though this study, these studies together had looked at 160,000 people. Now, this problem that we know that the phenotype of height is highly heritable, and yet a very high resolution, powerful search for the genetic differences that are responsible only found genes that explain 10% of the difference. Now, it's not that genome-wide studies are not powerful. They're extremely powerful, as shown by the small effect of the differences that they found. If there had been genes that caused big differences, the genome-wide association studies would certainly have found them. Do we just need to look harder? Do we need to examine even more people? Well, the researchers think that no, that's not the problem, because they did a calculation based on a statistical analysis of all the studies that had been done so far, they were able to predict that there might be as many as 700 places in the genome where differences affect, genome differences affect height. They would be found by studies that examined maybe 500,000 people, but these 
positions altogether would only be expected to explain 16% of the difference in height. So it's not that we need to do more, more powerful studies. One alternative explanation is that many of the contributions to variation in height may come from alleles that are rare in the whole population. Um, there are likely to be millions and millions of such alleles. Genome-wide association studies only look at SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism positions. These are positions where the less common allele is present in at least 1% of the population. But this is not most of the positions in the genomes where there exists any genetic variation because there are many, many more places in the genome that don't qualify as SNPs because the frequency of the rare allele is a lot less than 1% of the population. All of us have many alleles in our genomes that don't qualify as SNP positions because they're very rare in the population. One way to think about this is that these might be alleles that are very common in our family, perhaps because they arose by mutation in a particular grandparent. So an allele may be common in one family, but rare in the whole population. And in fact, many, many alleles in each of us arose by mutation in recent ancestors so that they're present in us, but they're not common in the whole population. It's possible that these rare alleles are making substantial contributions to our height. We don't know this, but it's possible. Another possibility is that contributions to variation in height might come from interaction effects between these different genes. So if there are, say, 700 genes, because I'll write positions, but they are likely genes, where variation affects height, on their own, each gene might have only a small effect, but interactions between, say, this gene and this gene and this gene, the kinds of interactions that we talked about in Module 4, these interaction effects may be responsible for a large proportion of the differences in height. The truth is, researchers don't know yet. This is one of the, the frontiers of genetic research. So we've talked about the trying to find the genetic differences that are responsible for differences in height and brought up the, the findings that the effects are very small of each individual genetic difference and that the combined effects are still very small. They don't explain most of the variation. This is true not just for height but for most other phenotypes that have been studied and you'll see um, more examples of this um, in the next module when we talk about personal genomics, that most of the alleles that affect most of the variation that we are interested in have surprisingly small effects. And there are really very few cases where natural, naturally variable phenotypes are known to be controlled by genes that have big effects. Coming up next, we're going to talk about another corollary of what we've discussed here, which is that each variant that we've discovered that affects one phenotype typically affects many different phenotypes. This is an expansion of the concept of pleiotropy that we introduced in Module 4. I hope to see you there.